message that honorable clerk would like to be excused at 19 hours. Uh, and also we we still continue wishing our wishing our chairperson a speedy recovery and looking forward for his return in the near future. Uh, other than that, Marcy, do we have any other apologies from your no, side? No, 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 chair, no, no, no. Okay. What I'll request, uh, it seems like Honorable Dooley had a, a problem with a um, link, a, a link. If we can just text her again, I don't know what happens with the email to, to some of us. Having said that, uh, honorable members, um, I would like to suggest the approach so that uh, all members can have a benefit of also having listened to the, to the presentations uh, without rushing the meeting. But firstly, to say that uh, Today's purpose of today's meeting is to deal with the three to receive three uh, uh, presentations as outlined in our in our program that we were, all of us who have received and also I'm sure that honourable members they did have a chance to go through the the presentations that were circulated to us uh, sometime earlier this week. The first one that I would suggest that we take all three uh, uh, presentations, which would be the, the presentation on e-government and digitalization of government services, uh, as it were, which is an ongoing uh, 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 discussion that will continue. And members, I, I humbly also remind them that we had planned sometime in November this year that we'll have a joint meeting or I'm suggesting that in November we should have a, a joint a, a joint meeting with the Portfolio Committee of Communication since the issue of communication, as it were, uh, they, they, they overlap between the two uh, departments and portfolio committees so that also we can have a common understanding and they complement each other to ensure that we, have, we encourage a spirit of building a capable, ethical and professional public service and addressing its service through technology. But also there's a a center where a principal a project leader of driving this process is very clear within these two departments. Secondly, honorable members, I would like then, because I've suggested that we must look at the, take the three uh, uh, presentations as it were. The other one that we are going to receive is from the DPSA through the public service on the disciplinary uh, management status report which I'm sure that uh, we will also receive from the presenters uh, through the minister and the, and the DPSA. They will also do this. I normally call it the show and tell in terms of the specific, and I'm sure that it will be incorporated, although in the presentation that we have received, it was too generic. Um, with the, uh, what has been done to the study, who's supposed to be implementing the recommendations because it was a joint one, and how far are those recommendations, if there were any recommendations, because I didn't have time to go through it. Uh, with that, honorable members, and also I hope and we agree with me that we'll have the, all uh, three presentations, and then after that we'll engage. I will request that, uh, as usual, that the, uh, the minister Honorable Mkunu, uh, you are mostly welcome and your team that you do your overview, opening remarks on the subject matters that we're going to be looking at, and then we will hand over to your officials who indicate who will be doing the presentation as it were. Thank you very much, Honorable Members, and good evening, Minister. Uh, good evening, Chair, and good, good evening, DM, and good evening, uh, uh, colleagues in the National Assembly. In the chair, we are going to follow our agenda. Um, but just to say that uh, we do have relevant opinions on each of the issues that are on the agenda. 
they will uh, go through in uh, greater detail or in all detail. I do see. I do see that we have to act in the interest of time um, and not uh, make <clears throat> and maybe go straight to the presentation. Um, by, I mean, the first presentation on the government, which will be done by the uh, let, let, let me uh, uh, just take it uh, as simple as that, uh, uh, Chair, and call on uh, DG and DG to make the presentation. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, uh, Honorable Minister. But at the end, also, probably just for the sake of interest, without going to details, to give us a sense of comfort in terms of the Public Service Commission stability, as it were. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Over to you, DG. Uh, thanks very much, uh, uh, Honorable Chair. Thanks very much, Minister, and to the Honorable Members. I think I'll, I'll try to share my screen so that I can do the presentation of uh, uh, what I have already. Um, it doesn't look like it is showing. Uh, let me try again. Um, I would suggest that probably just start while we are still uh, trying to be it because I'm sure honorable members, they did receive the presentation and just make reference to the pages or in terms of the slide numbers. Or oh, there is it now. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, thanks, thanks very much, Chair. I'll do exactly that. I'll do exactly that. Uh, as indicated, Chair, honorable members, it's really an honor for, for me to be part of uh, this meeting. I think the request from the committee obviously was on e government plan uh, uh, that is in place with the intention of digitalizing the public service. So what I have here is a presentation that is looking at the, I mean, this is the outline of the issues of the presentation itself. And the purpose of this presentation, Honorable Chair and members, is basically to update the portfolio committee on the e-government plan, as well as the implementation thereof in order to transform uh, government service into digital public service, but also to request the support and inter intervention from the committee in, in facilitating the implementation of the program across the public service. Um, I think, uh, Honorable Chair, this slide is basically talking to the fact that we want to be mindful of the fact that when we talk digital, generally we are referring to two issues, not just technology, but also the need to redesign the entire public service in the context of government, both in terms of structures, processes, practices and legislation. Now, this slide as well, Chair, talks to the fact that the issues of IT in the public service are as old as 1998, when the uh, Commission of 1998 was charged with uh, verifying the state of the country as we are transiting or as it transited to the democratic dispensation. And, and in some area, the three things you do identify inadequate coordination, systems that don't work together, and lack of value for money from IT investment. And the recommendation was that ICT decisions must come from senior uh, political and managerial leadership rather than IT specialists. So that it was not treated the same as human resource, financial, and other material resources. So that became a recommendation. But then as part of that, Honorable Chair, there was a policy in 2001 on e-government which was developed, which had the foc focus areas of security, citizen convenience, digital inclusion. And this was taken to cabinet through the cabinet memo. And then fast forward in 2017, uh, DTPS then, which is now DZDT, then took, uh, made a little bit of a, a few amendments and took that to, to cabinet to be gazetted into what is now known as the e-government policy. But then, uh, obviously, then the, then uh, MPSA requested that, given the trends, uh, uh, we need to have some kind of a digital transformation strategy, which we prepared and we presented on this day, which is 27 November 2018, to cabinet. Uh, but then at that stage, chair, we were uh, requested to kind of hold because uh, Honourable President uh, indicated that there was this commission that was going to formulate as per the then son of 2018, which was done in April 2019 with 30-man membership. Uh, uh, and then the commission basically was to come up with a strategy the plan for the country, which was going to have all the, the implications for all the sectors. And our view when we went was that we were providing a strategy only for the public service. And then and then we do know that on, on the 6th of August, uh, which is still this month, then the commission presented the product of their work to the president, who are informed that it is going to come to 
parliament to cabinet for consultation with honorable members. But the next slide, Chair and members, talk to the issues of e-government. I won't even dwell much on this, given the promise uh, and the comments from the Chair when opening to say, given the, uh, the, the mandate and overlapping, uh, there's going to be a meeting. So this, this slide is basically trying to indicate that, to say MPSA is charged with norms and standards on e-government, uh, amongst other things, uh, and improving service delivery. And CETA is charged with that responsibility because they're part of the same uh, uh, under the MPSA. So basically, CETA Act is the mirror of Public Service Act, but then the Electronic Communications Act talks to the need to develop the national strategy, right? The national e strategy, which has got a chapter on e government. And it is said that when that chapter is dealt with, consultation must be made with the MPSA. I think this slide, uh, uh, Chair, still talk to the same thing, to say with issues of uh, ICT in the public service tend to be contentious at times, given the various role players. And this slide is kind of trying to, is, is actually outlining the various role players. DCDT, which is designated as the shareholder on behalf of the state on national ICT infrastructure about ports and telecommunications broadcasting policy. Science and innovation deals with innovation from all aspects, but including ICT. Uh, uh, trade and uh, uh, um, uh, industry and competition deals with um, developing and influence trade on various as various companies, various sectors, but also including IT, SSA, security, MPSA, all aspects of ICT in the public service, given the model of the branch, CETA and GTOS. Home Affairs, deal, uh, Honorable Chair, deals with identity management in the public service. And in the space of e government, that is very important. We have also seen National Treasury uh, uh, Chair coming up with various RT contracts. One of the latest being, for instance, RT15, where Vodacom kind of um, was awarded the contract. I think this slide, Chair, uh, it does nothing much except to say, why do we talk e government? Why do we talk digital? One thought that possibly it might be of value to honorable members to say, when you talk e government, it's, in, it's basically the initial stage of advancement leveraging technology. And when you move from left to right, you would see that the most mature institutions of government will be a smart government. And there are those uh, characteristics um, that, that, that um, would constitute each government at, at, or, or organization at various phases. And I'll, so I'll jump that. Uh, given. And, then, and, and then the request, Honorable Chair, was to say, let us look at the e-government program and the implementation thereof. I think if I wanted to give a little bit of, 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 of history on this one is that when we are presenting the strategy, digital transformation strategy in 2018 as indicated. Then cabinet no, uh, indicated that it was going to be commissioned, but also said that uh, we need to be coordinating as MPSA, the, how the, the e-government roadmap is going to look like. And then there were various meetings, chair involving uh, DGs from both departments, involving officials, and we came up with this uh, program. We call it a draft because uh, we're hoping that even the, the conversation that is going to happen uh, would kind of assist in strengthening it, and then we're able to take it across the public service. Are there any activities happening on this program as things stand now? Yes, there are, honorable chair and honorable members. And you would see those uh, as they exist, for instance, even on our APPs uh, as a department. So on the extreme left, you've got the strategy out, uh, outcome, which is you want to transform the services. Now, how are you going to do that? First of all, understand what exists, uh, use the, the CETA e-services portal, identify importantly the processes through which these services are delivered because honorable chair and members, at times some of the processes that government, public service follows in delivering services are kind of not streamlined. So it becomes important that before, before you adopt technology, make sure that you have brought in efficiencies at the, at, at the process level. You, so you streamline them, you re-engineer them. Now the need to audit ICT, I think chair will kind of seen the impact of, for instance, inadequate coverage, uh, given the, uh, the, COVID, uh, the COVID pandemic. I mean, there are areas where really we are struggling. The same can, can be said with uh, public service institutions. Uh, some of them don't have connectivity. We constantly engage CETA uh, with facilities, for instance, within the correctional services environment and various other environments. So, so the idea here is to say we align with the um, SA Connect in terms of making sure that we make, we kind of make that being realized. So so as part of, of, of the program as well, uh, we've got home affairs that is working on the national identity system. How do you identify people, uh, particularly uh, or including on the electronic or digital space? 
so the last activity chair that we're doing here was to uh, was to work on a, a, a identity policy with home affairs. And then chair one is hoping that as part of the engagement towards the end of the year, uh, or whenever between the committees, would actually assist us in coming up with some governance structure, particularly between these two departments, this is and TPSA, but also importantly, your home affairs uh, and even your SSA, to say how are you going to govern issues of e-government going forward? So, so the program also consists of the data standard because, Chair, one of the things that there is, there is a reality effect is the fact that during this time of the fourth industrial revolution, one of the important things is data. Now, how public service handles data um, is not uniform across. So the standard is trying to come up with that and then transform relevant legislations where necessary and ensure that we're able to monitor progress on an annual basis. And then the program, Chair, also envisages the issues of skills, and one can indicate that on this one, one of the one of the key players in the area of digital transformation. We've had a meeting with them around June, where it was a representative from there, and then the principal of the National School of Government, around how the two can 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 um, work together. But also even from the DCDG point of view, we know that this, uh, the strategy, uh, the digital skills strategy, was kind of. Um, approved just uh, in August, and yesterday we had a tutor council meeting where it was presented to us. But importantly, Chair, is the issue of change management, because the issues of e-government and digital transformation, they start to say things that we have been doing all along, that we have been comfortable to do. We need to start to change how we are doing them. Um, and for instance, if I may make an example, um, we have a situation where a citizen would apply for, and I've used this example before, you apply for an ID at Home Affairs. The, the ID comes back with wrong um, uh, some details, as an example. Now, the issue is that in the process of creating the smart ID, who was actually having the responsibility of managing the process behind? So what does it mean? If you are responsible to produce the ID, it shouldn't just be an ID and you count the number of IDs produced, but also the process. So that you look at the efficiency thereof, you are able to explain and account what went wrong where that led to a, a wrong ID being issued, as an example. And then the next slide, Chair, it was to say, how do we then bring this home potentially to DPSA? Because at times issues of e-government or even digital transformation get confused in the in the, in the, in the discussion and the talk. And then we say, we then took Chair the various areas in, in DPSA. And you say, I mean, if I'm, not, if I'm not to look at administration and go, go straight to human resource management and development branch, things like online recruitment becomes important. Things like individual performance management that are done online. Things like online leave, online uh, submission and spaceship. So all this online activity, what do they talk about? They talk about services that are going to make available to the public servant. So they start consuming them because the issues of transformation, modernization, e-government chair, they do want you to ensure that first and foremost, your own employees within the organization understand what you are dealing with before you can think that you are going to ensure that the citizen um, is, is, is benefiting. And then another branch chair, uh, so you would see that we're even uh, providing the potential timelines when we can do this. Another branch that deals with uh, labor relations, you're saying besides the compliance on issues of labor relations, uh, one issue that I, I kind of picked here, Chair, amongst many, uh, we're currently working away from home, and one of the promises of digital transformation is that it's going to bring about flexibility, for instance. There's going to be balance between work life as well as your normal life. And yet our regulations are saying a, a, a working hour or a working week consists of 40 hours. Now, what does this mean? For instance, if I've got two hours to spare in the evening between eight and nine, those can be considered for me to do work that does not need to deliver service, that does not need me to be facing a city. So we're saying regulations must be reviewed as well. So we took that, this as an example, but there are many. It could even be the, the entry requirement to the public service. It is still okay to talk about either grade 12 as the minimum or M plus three. When, 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 when training institutions and institutes are able to train now the youth that is upcoming, that all of us are concerned about not having employment, over a period of a month or two, and they come back with a skill and they can add value. So, so, so that's what we mean when we talk about the review of the various regulations. And e-government as a branch within uh, within uh, DPSA can be looking at things like, for instance, 
engaging departments to ensure that now the services that are available over the counter are moved to online uh, platforms so that in errors in errors or times like this, for instance, citizens are able to access a public service without necessarily having to go physically to service delivery uh, sites. I mean, but also the resuscitation of the digital transformation strategy that uh, tra yeah, tra strategy that we took we have the view that it needs to go back, but working with various in, uh, institutions like CSIR and, and, and so on, it becomes important and relevant for a branch like the e-government branch. So, so I, I think this chair having spoken about the, then we've got people responsible for service delivery. Again, here we're saying if there could be a know your service uh, campaign citizen, what is the idea behind that? So that you are able to say who came to what, whatever uh, service delivery point, what was their request, what was the outcome? So that so we then start saying when when I come for the second or third time, month, I will understand that you are in the same department or somewhere in the government to ask for this service. How can we help you today? All right? Uh, how, how and so on. So you start predict predicting and offering services proactively to the citizen. And all that it takes here is to ensure that systems integrate, uh, process integrate. There is coordination amongst departments. Now. In support chair of this, the, the program we spoke about, this is the APP of, 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 of DPSA, particularly e government branch. So we're looking at auditing e government strategy, and on this we're working together with the presidency, developing the standards which on data governance, um, as, uh, auditing ICT infrastructure, uh, working together with SSA on information security standards, revised the governance, but also the compliance report. And then Chair, for all these things to happen, uh, we are saying there are things that must be in place. Number one, we're not, and we're not going to dwell much on this, so it's improved governance at all levels. There must be coordination, there must be the required policies. That is why, Chair, you would say the previous slides were too much, because policies are going to give you direction. Because in the absence of those, you find that uh, all stakeholders are going to work. But centralized decision making becomes important. So even if there are many uh, stakeholders, but they form a particular kind of center and decisions get taken there. Improve security, amend legislation, change money. Importantly, Chair, centralized funding. E government, digital transformation, fire issues, they require investment, Chair. Unfortunately, upfront investment. So, I mean, uh, uh, today, for instance, we're having this meeting uh, with the committee. All of us had to have access to a computer and paid for that, as well as the Microsoft license that give up are using. So it becomes important that you don't have each department spending separately on the same thing because you then lose economies of scope and scale, right? Skills development chain is one of the enabler because how then do people work in, 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 in the new environment? But then ability to, to then be able to read the information that you get across the public service from an intelligence point of view and the use of uh, platforms as well as appropriate connectivity. I think, Chair, on this on this slide, Chair, we, we, I think we're speaking to what we already know. Uh, to, if if one has to consider your comments of for the upcoming meeting, when when the proclamation for the seven was passed in in, in 2014, Chair, uh, it, it was because of obviously e-government being seen across, but within the public service there were issues that there was a level of impact. Now, for instance, the the model which would have been put in place by the 1998 PRC was kind of dismantled. You have a situation here with developed norms and standards, for instance, as DPSA, but the implementation is sitting elsewhere. And, and, and when you engage at times, it's not as easy as this. But also the move, um, kind of move CETA away from the center of government. And what is the significance of that, Chair? Center of government departments are able to issue norms and standards for departments to comply. Now, when CETA is outside of that, it means that at times it's difficult to ensure that people uh, or departments comply with whatever requirements emanate from CETA. Um, and, and but it then left a vacuum for a public service. Who build these solutions for the public service if CETA is not there? So it becomes, it, it, so these that are just some of the issues that kind of came up as, as we're engaging together with the heads of IT in the public service. And then the last slide, Chair, is around the issues that are needing urgent attention and just the points of emphasis, Chair. Like I've indicated, one has got to comfort uh, the fact that there is a talk of the upcoming meeting, but also, Chair, I think we are of the view that the Interministerial Committee on 4IR, which was constituted in July last year by the Honourable President, still remains then relevant because you've got alignment at all levels. At times you find that Department A were preoccupied with this activity. When you engage colleagues, uh, they then they've got other activities which, which might not be aligned. But also they need to ensure that issues of ICT see visibility, get visibility from the GSIT cluster. 
and, and the need for the strategy to be taken back to cabinet, obviously to be presented, whoever needs to be presented, and the need to centralize funding Jay, to ensure that the way that we invest, if we, all of us are saying we are investing on this uh, area and we want to, uh, to take advantage of economies of scope and scale, you don't find a situation where small departments as service providers they do. For instance, on the issues of licensing, they tell you that if your department has got 150 or less employees, your pricing per unit changes, it becomes more expensive. And yet it is one government. Issues of change management with a focus on skills development as well is important and connectivity is, is important. Now, broadband connectivity across the country doesn't sit with DPSA, it sits with DCDT. Uh, I thank you, Honorable uh, Chair, Ministers and the members. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Principal, if I may. That will bring us to request, uh, honor, uh, Honorable Minister, that uh, uh, from the Public Service Commission to get a presentation on the on the disciplinary cases, uh, uh, briefing from the DPSA on the disciplinary cases, numbers of the suspended employees and cost of suspension of those uh, of the those public servants as it were uh, and i'm sure you'll be able to walk us through i'm not too sure uh, honorable minister is going to take us through because here we yes let me just stop there and hand over to you again uh, thank, you, thank you very much chair we do have uh, um, the dg or no. alternatively, um, uh, the presenter under her uh, on this matter, DG. Over to you, ma'am. DG, Miss Yoli, are you there? Minister, I am available to present. Okay, thank you. Over to you. Um, honorable members, I've been asked to um, present on the status of discipline management in the public sphere. I have um, shared this with um, you in the Are you able to see presentation and hear me? Yes, now it's much better and we can Perfect. see the presentation. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, on, now, yeah, volume is off. Uh, okay. yeah. Solomon seems to have a, a problem. Yeah. And may we get another person to assist the Honorable Minister? Is this yes. better, ma'am? Okay. So let me continue. The current status I'm going to uh, present. Then the identified causes for failure, the identified challenges, and the interventions by the DBSA. So the purpose is to provide the portfolio committee with an update on the disciplinary cases, the number of suspended employees and the cost of precautionary suspension of public service employees. Now, the role of the DPSA, one must rem remember that discipline management is a decentralized process and it's the direct responsibility of the HODs of the port.
timelines of the disciplinary and then to assist with the interpretation of chapter seven of the SMS handbook. To assist the DPSA to monitor and obtain statistics on discipline management, the DPSA issued a circular already in six, on 16th of January 2012 and 17 November 2014 for all the departments to report quarterly statistics on disciplinary matters to the DPSA on a prescribed template. Now, these reports are received quarterly and the DPSA consolidates the information the the December the fourth quarter is the, the in comparison, the first bar indicates the total number of misconduct cases reported, where in um, quarter three it was 816, and in quarter four it is 1070. The second bar is the, the second bar is the total number of misconduct cases finalized, and that increased from quarter three from 377 to 664. The third bars are the total number of cases on days. And that for Yeah, seems to have a challenge. We can't hear you now. You have disappeared. Uh, I'm audible now. We can't hear your voice. Uh, am I audible now? Yes, now now you are. Yes, thank you. It looks don't, like don't there's more people. Where you're seated. <laughs> I'm I'm uh, on one stationary position. It looks like more people are using the internet in the evenings because I never had this problem in the day, but I'll push quickly. So the, the last one is the total number of the um, misconduct cases pending. And in quarter three, it was 439, and quarter four, that improved to 415. So we move to the next slide. The following the provincial departments we compare quarter to quarter four it's the third quarter where um, the total number of misconduct cases received was 2053 and in quarter four that was 1626 so the total number of misconduct cases finalized is 716 for quarter three and that improved to 468 in quarter four now the total number of misconduct cases finalized within 90 days period was um, 495 in quarter three and that's 347 in quarter four the total number of misconduct cases finalized outside the 90 days was 221 in quarter three and 121 in quarter. The total number of misconduct cases pending 
is 1,337 in quarter um, three and 1,158 in quarter four. Now, this, this um, is just, just a breakdown of all the uh, misconduct cases per province, the number of misconduct cases received in the, the first columns, the number of misconduct cases finalized, the number of sexual harassment, abuse of sick leave, drunk on duty, insolent behavior, failure to declare previous misconducts, prejudice and disrespect, theft, fraud and bribery. Then you will also find that there's um, some criminal elements here and under the public administration, under the Public Administration Management Act, those must be reported to, under the Public Administration Act, the criminal elements must be reported to SAPS for investigation. So that um, is then the responsibility of SAPS. So looking at the precautionary suspensions, um, on the right hand side, you will find the total in total is 140 of which national department is 103 and provinces 37 and the total number of precautionary suspensions is 306 of which 80 is departments and 223 in provinces. Going to the um, cost of precautionary suspensions, if we compare quarter three to quarter four, for national departments, we had a decrease in quarter three from four in from you have disappeared am i back chairperson Yes, now you are. Thank you. I'm sorry for this, but this is beyond my control. Um, the reduction that I uh, um, uh, indicated is uh, can also be contributed to the fact that two provinces did not report. DJ, you want to take over? I'll try, Chairperson. I hope my co my own connection won't disappoint me. Let's give it a try. Thank you. Thank you, Chairperson. But I'm not gonna be able to show to show the screen until he he takes it out from his side. So I think that members have the copy of the presentation, basically. So the, the slide that he was talking to now uh, highlights the fact that there's two. <laughs> no, let's, uh, let's, let's text him and ask him to then get to, 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 to mute so that he doesn't continue. Yeah, because we, it feels we, like he doesn't we, hear us. We, we, yes, sir, we're trying to connect him. We're trying to phone him. Uh, DJ can continue while we phone him. Thank you, Honorable Thank Minister. Thank you, Minister. Chairperson, let me also apologize for joining late. I've just been having connection problems today. I'm not sure what's happening with my wife. 
But um, the so so what we are clarifying, what we are highlighting in this slide is that two provinces did not submit. So it, that could account for the uh, little bit of reduction that you are, that is showing in terms of the provincial departments. These provinces are Gauteng and Bumalanga, and it's doing our statistics. We have made attempts to follow up on the provinces, and we didn't receive the information on time. The, also, the reduction in costs from Limpopo, who reduced their cost from 3.9 million to just less than 1 million. So it means Limpopo has processed a number of um, uh, 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 suspensions that have been uh, sitting in the system in the previous quarters. Just in terms of the total cost of precautionary suspensions for national departments, which is the next slide, we, we, we are having these departments, uh, correctional services at 4.8 million, Department of Employment and Labor at 410,000, Environmental Affairs at 269,000, Government Communications and Information Systems at 40,000, Higher Education and Training at 3 million, 3.6, Home Affairs at 66,000, Independent Police Investigative Directorate at 393, Office of the Chief Justice at 136,000, Public Enterprises at 42,000, uh, public works and infrastructure at 94,000, subs at 1.1 million, social development at 237. Um, and then you have, uh, if you look at the uh, comparison between quarter three and quarter four now for provinces, you would look at, uh, for instance, the, 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 those are the figures that you are getting from the provinces. Uh, in quarter three, we had about 40 employees from the Eastern Cape at 5 million, at 5.9. Now we have six employees from the Eastern Cape reported. Oh, in quarter three, we had, uh, sorry, um, I, I confused myself there. I'm just going to make an, an example about a few provinces. I won't go in all detail. In, For instance, in Eastern Cape, you had uh, six, report, six reported in quarter one, in quarter three. Um, and uh, the cost was 5 million and 18. Now you have 40 reported, the cost is 5.9 5 million in quarter four. And then if maybe we look at another province uh, that has, um, uh, maybe let's look at Northern Cape. Northern Cape had six, reported six for 1.4 million. And um, in quarter three and in quarter four, they are reporting 11 for 1.5. A million. Now, uh, I'm going to leave that and just go to some of the identified causes for failure to meet the 90-60 day target. These are the reasons that we are getting from, uh, from the departments and the provinces. There's an issue around the complexity of the cases that are involved, and there's an issue around unavailability of investigators and chairpersons and um, uh, discipline being delegated to labor relations practitioners management engage, engaging with unions, interference by outside stakeholders, consequences of delays. The delays causes employees to declare disputes regarding the principle of justice. Justice delayed is justice denied or waiver by the employer. Just um, uh, COVID-19 also resulted in late submissions of quarter four reports. Uh, departments are not meeting the timeframes on final, finalizing cases and some departments report selectively. So uh, it's possible that even some of the information from the departments is not complete um, um, uh, because um, um, the, some of the, I mean, if you look at the figures, it, sometimes it doesn't make sense. Six people, it's 5 million, and um, 11 people is um, uh, 5.9 million. So, uh, so that's data that we dig and dig further into the data. Departments are not adhering to collective agreements or resolutions. And some departments utilize legal representations as a norm rather than an exception, resulting in long delays and additional costs in finalizing cases. Analysis of data is difficult because of late submissions, inconsistent reporting, and manual capturing of information. Interventions, sub, below are some of the interventions by DPSA. The Public Administration Ethic, Integrity, and Disciplinary Technical Unit was established to develop norms and standards on disciplinary matters related to misconduct and to provide technical assistance on disciplinary matters. 
relating to misconduct in the public administration. Dr. Salomon, who was presenting earlier, is the acting chief director for that unit. We have complete. We have completed. Uh, well, we have not offered a letter yet, but we have done interviews. Uh, the candidates are going for competency assessments. Uh, so it is in our plans to finish to complete the recruitment process. Um, as soon once the competency assessments have been done, uh, bookings are still being done for that by the department. The personal system is being reconfigured to allow departments to capture cases for reporting and monitoring. So I want to talk about the personal system in context to the to this next item, which is uh, there's a project that we launched to analyze the cause of backlogs so as to recommend methods to reduce backlogs, to assess the appropriateness of policies and to recommend interventions to be applied. This will assist with setting the norms and standards for disciplinary matters, for discipline matters related to misconduct. A system will be adopted to automatically generate suspensions with departments compelled to report suspension to the DPSA, where after they will receive a number, a reference number, and which will allow DPSA to track progress. This project, we, in terms of the project plan, is going to be completed in November. It is a project supported by the one of our donors, the Canadians. And uh, what the information that we are getting out of that project will assist us in completing the process of the norms and standards, as well as the changes that should be made on the personal system. So there is a revamp of the system that we are putting in place. However, there is the project that is still um, uh, looking at what are the real causes of the backlogs. Uh, in, 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 the, in the various departments. The DPSA has also established a pool of labor relations specialists to assist departments with chairperson and initiators, and it's rolling out a capacity building program in partnership with PCTA to train 200 initiators and chairpersons for disciplinary cases. To address the overdue suspensions, letters were drafted in August 2020 to all departments with cases older than one year, wherein the MPSA calls for urgent one-on-one -on -one discussions with the executive authorities and heads of departments to address the backlogs and to uh, ensure that from a DPSA perspective, we offer whatever support we need to offer. But in return, they also offer support to us as people who have to account on a quarterly basis in relation to this information. Chairperson, this is the end of the report. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, DG. Uh, now we'll request the Public Service Commission to do their presentation. Over to you, Mr. Sloane. I'm not to, Commissioner Sloane. I'm not too sure whether I didn't see the chairperson, but you may. I'm sure you are the one who read in the delegation. Over to you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Chair. Uh, I have been delegated to come and do the presentation, <clears throat> mainly because I'm the convener for the specialist team in the commission that is dealing with integrity and anti-corruption. So let me try and put the slide on the... Uh, okay, so it's not... Uh, okay, here it is. I hope that you can see it, Chair. We can see it now. Thank you so much. You may proceed. OK. No, thanks. Uh, the outline will be dealing with uh, the background and then the NAC statistics for 2019-20, NAC statistics breakdown per quarter. Uh, but I will not go through the entire presentation, but just to take uh, the salient points. With, with, with respect to the background, uh, maybe I need to indicate upfront uh, because sometimes uh, it is assumed that all members understand uh, the role of the commission. The commission is independent and is, is established by uh, section Mr. Uh, Mr. one. Mr. Sloan, if I may assist, we do. We started okay. this uh, new administration last year. We do by now. Okay, so I should <coughs> go to, yes. to, to those details. Yes. Okay. Uh, if, if you look at the background slide, uh, the third bullet there talks to the number of uh, uh, complaints that we, <clears throat> we received from 2017. Just to indicate that before 2017, the National Anti-Corruption Hotline 
was managed by the service provider. And then because it was costing too much money and very expensive for the commission, we decided to manage the, uh, 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 the hotline internally. And since we started in 2017, we received 189,067 complaints. And then out of those, 3,549 complaints, uh, cases were generated for investigation. Uh, going to the background again, I will skip that slide and then go to the slide on number five. Uh, in there, it shows what we have been asked to uh, present on, the statistics for 2019-2020. Uh, so in that year, we received 70,000 calls, and then 1,591 cases were generated out of them. The remaining six, 68,909 incoming calls are mainly inquiries which are answered on the spot. Uh, some of the calls are unanswered because uh, our uh, officials work nine to five and five days in a week. And then amongst those is 110 cases uh, which uh, may not fall within the mandate of the commission or there was no clear suspicions. And then out of that uh, 1,591, 1,007 cases, which constitute about 63% of the 1591, were referred to SASA. And when they are referred to SASA, they are closed immediately. And those uh, uh, cases involve social grant fraud. And then 508 of those 500, uh, 1591 were referred to different departments, relevant departments to investigate. And when the departments have finished investigating those uh, complaints, they bring them back to the commission and the, uh, uh, the commission satisfy itself whether the investigation was correct or not. And then uh, the cases that were referred to SASA, they involved about 217,000 and SASA was able to recover about 106,000. And the next slide is just the breakdown on how many complaints came in. I will pass that one. Uh, even uh, the breakdown per quarter, I will pass that one. And then provincial and national, I will also pass that one because it's summarized in that uh, slide. And then I'll go to slide number nine. And in this slide, maybe just to indicate, uh, in the commission, we've got four panels dealing with complaints. And the four panels is three dealing with the provinces and then one dealing with national departments. So those are called complaints and grievance panels. These are the panels which decide whether to close the case or to continue uh, uh, investigating. Uh, those panels in the 1920 financial year finalized 64, closed 64 cases. Uh, for 1920 financial year, and then uh, 93, which were from the previous financial years, and then 1007, as I've indicated earlier, were referred to uh, public entity SASA. And then the 110 that I referred to, uh, those cases, sometimes the complaints did not reasonably raise suspicion, or the complainants were informed that another law enforcement agency or court was more appropriate to deal with the matter, or the matter f fell outside the mandate of the commission. And then when we go to the next slide uh, uh, about the tip-offs, because National Anti-Corruption Hotline is where whistleblowers from the public or even from the public service tips uh, uh, the, 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 the commission about uh, cases of uh, malpractice, mal, maladministration, or malpractices. So now it became one of the most useful in instruments for reporting complaints during COVID-19 national lockdown. That's that's an example of uh, how powerful the, instru the instrument uh, hotline is all about. And the, the tip-offs, some of them were immediately referred to South African police service. And then when they were reported to South African Police Service, a number of uh, people, for example, in Colonnade in Swan, after getting 
information. The police were informed, and then they were arrested there and there using the the, 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 the slides, using the cuts from uh, Sasa. And then uh, some of them, on further investigations, were found elsewhere with a number of Sasa cuts and more than uh, 32,000 rand uh, in their in, in, in their pockets, so they were arrested. So Nakh basically is working with the police, and then uh, cases are able to be dealt with immediately. And then some of the uh, uh, tip-offs is about service delivery failures, which we are immediately referring to the relevant department to follow up, and then we monitor that indeed those departments are able to uh, implement the. the the, the recommendations coming from the PSC. And then I will skip that slide and indicate in the next slide uh, the, the graph there. Now you can see from 17, 18, when we started, uh, uh, the total number of calls went down from 66,000 to about 51,000 because there were still some teething problems in uh, uh, ensure, uh, ensuring that the system is well managed. And then uh, from 18, 19, it shot up to 70,500. But when you look at the number of uh, uh, cases generated, they moved from 882 in 17, 18, uh, to 1076 in uh, 18, 19, and to 1,591 in uh, uh, 1920. So uh, uh, for 2021, uh, uh, looking at the diagram there, I'm definitely sure that it will be an increase because people are getting confident uh, uh, with the with the system. And then a uh, comparative analysis has been described in that uh, diagram, so I will pass that slide. Go to the slide on uh, uh, the types of allegations that we are receiving. So the types of allegations involve social grant fraud, abuse of government resources, mismanagement of funds, procurement irregularities, appointment irregularities, fraudulent visas, service delivery complaints. And when we receive complaints about procurement irregularities or appointment irregularities, we don't refer them to uh, departments. We investigate the, uh, 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 those complaints ourselves. And then uh, the next slide indicates the successes uh, on the recommendations that we have, we have made with respect to national departments, where there were final written warning um, uh, two months suspensions, dismissals, uh, and even uh, uh, some of the officials charged uh, uh, with, with uh, uh, charged with South African Police Service. And then, when you go to the next slide, uh, uh, that's the summary of uh, those successful convictions. And then there are similar actions taking place at provincial level. If I can give an example uh, with how and where I'm working from, uh, there's the Department of Infrastructure, where the commission, after uh, finalizing the report, referred criminal matters to the Hawks to, uh, to investigate. And then also in the Department of Health, where, where, where we received uh, <clears throat> criminal matters, we referred them to the Hawks. But we uh, make recommendations uh, with Department of uh, Infrastructure that the relevant officials identified must be disciplined. And in the Department of Health, we even directed that uh, an irregular appointment must be set aside, obviously going to court to set that uh, uh, appoint, uh, appointment aside. And then when we go to the challenges uh, that we, uh, we are confronting with respect to NAH, PSC has observed that a number of departments are taking an extended period of time in providing feedback to the commission, despite the fact that whistleblowers uh, keep on pestering the commission to find some feedback. So we have engaged those uh, different departments that they must speed up the investigation. If they don't have the capacity, they must build up capacity of investigate, uh, investigating and to ensure that within 40 days, after being give, uh, referred the case that they report uh, to the commission. And when the commission, or oh, before that, uh, generally many investigations are prolonged due to a variety of factors, like some of the cases may be complex 
and then it will take long time to uh, investigate, or sometimes within the departments, uh, they are not able to uh, uh, retrieve certain supporting information which are needed uh, in the investigations. So when we established national, uh, we, we decided to run national anti-corruption hotline uh, within uh, the commission. Uh, as I've indicated earlier, we, we are operating five days a week and then, sorry, five days a week and eight hours per day. And then when people want to uh, uh, phone the hotline, usually they don't do it uh, when they are at work. They, 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 they call after hours and then, then they don't find anyone. They find a, a machine. And sometimes people do not want to talk uh, to the machine. So that's a challenge uh, which we're trying to address uh, to make sure that we operate 24 seven and then uh, throughout the week and throughout uh, uh, the day. So we will be asking for uh, a 5 million rand over and above the budget that we get. Uh, we, we, we made a proposal to the CARA uh, funding, a criminal asset recovery account, which is managed by the Department of Justice. Uh, to uh, because that funding deals with uh, anti-corruption cases uh, that we improve uh, our time and even the skills and capability of uh, the people in uh, uh, NAH. So NAH remains an important vehicle for reporting wrongdoing and corruption as evidenced by the number of calls that we are receiving. And then we will keep it and make sure that it's improved to, uh, to operate throughout the week and all hours and that uh, we are able to capture this. Now, uh, something linked to the mandate, which I want to put up front, is that the commission is supported by the Office of the Public Service Commission, which is a government department. And you might have heard that uh, there were uh, some malpractices related to uh, some of the members within the commission, and then uh, in particular the DG. And that's why, because the office is a government department and career incidents don't fall within the commission, the matter was referred to the presidency to deal with, and it is being given the necessary attention to make sure that uh, the reputation of the commission is restored. But besides that, the commission continues to ensure that uh, there is good governance uh, in the public service. And it will be working closely with government departments to ensure that good governance uh, is um, maintained. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Commissioner Sloan. Honorable members, we have received the, the three uh, presentations, but I just want to comment what a, a coincidence. Yesterday, we're adopting 2019 20 uh, board quarter report. Most of these issues were contained in that report. And I'm sure uh, uh, honorable members will engage with interest on this one, having to be made declarations yesterday. But allow me, honorable members, because honorable Clark, I hope she's still here. She did request that she would like to be excused almost uh, now uh, to, uh, to ask her to, to be the first one, followed by honorable Kipi, Kibi, followed by honorable Malazi, Followed, followed by Honorable Maluleka, uh, followed by Honorable Matsipe, Motsipe, uh, followed by Honorable Schreiber, and uh, last one, Honorable Julie, and myself, if I'm not covered by Honorable Members. Over to you, Honorable uh, Clark, if you're still here. Honorable Clark. Uh, she has excused us, Honorable Chair. Oh, she has left. Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay. Then I will uh, request Honorable Kibi if she does have anything to say or question. Over to you, ma'am. Hey, thank you. Thank you, Honorable Chair. Uh, Chair. Honorable Chair, with your permission, can I switch off my video? It seems as if I'm going to get problems. Yes, you may, ma'am. Thank you, thank you, Honorable Chair. Uh, good evening, Honorable Members and colleagues. Uh, let me first uh, uh, welcome and appreciate the presentations 
uh, the three presentations that have been presented to us uh, today. Honorable Chair, I want to, I'm having a, a whole lot of questions and I think each and every one is going to take what belongs to him or her. Uh, I want to know, Honorable Chair, what strategy is the department going to devise where departments uh, do not adhere to collective agreements or resolutions? Since this uh, practice contributes to the state losing a lot of uh, winnable cases against officials uh, misconducting themselves. My next one, Honorable Chair, is with the national cost of uh, suspension at uh, 11, uh, more than 11 million, and the provincial cost more than 74 million during quarter four only of 2019-20. What is uh, the average percentage of cost recovery in these cases on a yearly basis? My other one, Honorable Chair, is since there is a, such a huge backlog in provincial cases for the period from the 1st of January to the 31st of March 2020, is this due to the lockdown or are there other compelling reasons for the uh, backlog? Will these cases not expire on account of uh, timelines set to investigate and finalize disciplinary cases. My last one, Honorable Chair, uh, is there a memorandum of understanding among the stakeholders in the ICT space so that every activity by different departments complies with the legislation on ICT? Those are my questions. I thank you, Honorable Chair. Thank you, Honorable uh, KB. Let me also welcome, uh, I've noticed that uh, Honorable DM Chikunga has joined us as well. You are most welcome, ma'am. And also what a, a, a wonderful educative uh, webinar that you, you hold earlier on during the day. With that, then I will move to Honorable Malazi. Over to you, sir. Honorable Malazi. Thanks, House Chair, and, and, and greetings to all colleagues. I'm going to focus on, on, on two issues, one being something that um, is related to the presentation but wasn't in the content. But I think it's important because it, it, it serves to the, the strength of how when we initiate this discipline, Outcomes are then implemented because I see that there is a lot of focus in terms of initiated suspensions and that. But I just want to 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 get whether there is statistical information related to the number of those disciplinary processes that have resulted in criminal charges being laid um, against individuals that have been found guilty in those instances, so that we 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 can start to measure that over and beyond um, the internal HR processes where criminal acts have been um, have, have where criminal acts have taken place that there are criminal charges that are being laid. Um, so if we can get information around that, I'll be very grateful. And secondly, is is is, is to get um, whether there is appetite from the leadership in terms of blacklisting of public servants who have been found guilty at different stages in the public service of wrongdoing and unethical behavior that has resulted in monies that were, in fact, not just monies, that have been found guilty perpetually um, so that we, we can cleanse our public service of this constant recycling of unrehabilitated, unethical individuals who get suspended or dismissed at a national government department, and six months down the line, they they reemerge in some municipality in a very in a very senior role at the expense of the taxpayer. Because ultimately, we we have to protect the public service 
from unethical practices and from opportunistic individuals who even some of them um, are very strategic when disciplinary processes are initiated against them. Some of them, you know, resign halfway to take up other opportunities, whereas the consequences of the questionable and unethical transactions and decisions they were involved in remain haunting those um, departments and municipalities or spheres of government that they were serving previously. Thanks, Chair. Honorable Malazi, that will bring us to Honorable uh, uh, Honorable Malulega. Over to you, ma'am. Honorable Malulega. Chairperson, thank you very much, and good evening to everybody. Let me join other honorable members to appreciate the presentation, all three presentations. Honorable Chair, I think some of the questions, actually most of the questions that I wanted to ask, they've been asked by Honorable Kibi. And uh, I don't have other questions to, to ask then I'll just wait for the response. If maybe there are follow-ups, then I'll make follow-up questions. For now, I'm just happy. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, ma'am. Then that will bring us to Honorable Motsipe. Over to you, ma'am. Honorable Motsipe. Thank you very much, Honorable Chairperson. Uh, I would like to ask questions. Uh, the first one is what plans you are devising I'm referring to a government plan. What plans are you devising to have coordination among the stakeholders? And then here is, you said the development program to reskill the government employees for effective implementation of services. Uh, Honorable Chairperson, I've got a problem really in the rural areas because we keep on involving rural areas, but most of the time they are behind on everything. They don't have data, their gadget, they don't have even gadgets to can to can work on, like online recruitment. In rural areas, really, many people will never get employment due to online recruitment. Most of rural areas are left behind, but when uh, implementing things, they are involved. But coming to the implementation, really, they are always behind. And then the other question is, who exactly is the main role player concerning centralized decision making on digital e-government matters with participation or support from the other role players? The last one, I'm not sure if it was asked, since the role of the department is to facilitate the the sourcing of initiators and chairpersons as well as training of initiators and the chairpersons. And one of the causes of non-finalization of cases within the uh, mandatory period is an availability of investigators and chairpersons. Uh, can it not be said that the department itself is stiffing progress and finalization of cases and causing the public service to be a lot of money in the process. In the process, yes. And then here, which two provinces who did not bring the report? Because you said there are two provinces which did not get the report. May you please be specified and tell us which are those two provinces? Thank you very much, Honorable Chairperson. Honorable Motipe, that will bring us to uh, UN number five. Then uh, uh, Honorable Schreiber, then we'll follow up by Honorable Spisi if he had logged in. Thank you very much, Honorable Chair, and thank you for the presentations. Chair, just I think I can link to the question there from Honorable Motsepe. Uh, I think it would be Gauteng and Mpumalanga who did not submit those reports. But my question following up from that would be, what were the reasons that they actually gave? 
because you know we talk a lot about uh, disciplinary cases and consequence management and the DPS, DPSA's role in that, but if provinces uh, don't feel the need to actually comply and submit their reports, then they end up uh, undermining the work of the department. So what exactly were the reasons that Gauteng and Pumalanga gave and what recourse is there to actually make sure that they submit their data, but that they also don't repeat this kind of behavior in the future? Uh, Chair, also a second question to the DPSA uh, <clears throat> is that there's 85 million rand, if I understand it correctly, that <clears throat> that resulted from misconduct cases in the previous financial year. Um, I mean, the reason that this is very concerning, Chair, is that you you have the initial cost of misconduct or crimes in some cases, and then I assume this is the additional cost, the disciplinary cost, the, the cost of the disciplinary proceedings. In other words, people being put on precautionary suspension um, and, and costing money even in the process of trying to uh, sort of act against them. So then the question becomes how, how much of that 85 million was actually recovered thanks to disciplinary processes? So if, if there is a percentage or a figure, um, how much of that taxpayer money is actually recovered? And again, this is not even talking yet about the cost of the actual misconduct. Um, so I'd appreciate if, if the officials can give us some guidance on that. Uh, Chair, perhaps a question to the DG or, or to the minister regarding the technical unit. Um, I mean, we've seen an explosion of, of corruption reports and, and other uh, misconduct in the public service uh, especially now during this, this COVID period, uh, isn't this the moment where the technical unit is more needed than ever to provide that kind of support and uh, technical backup to make sure that these cases are handled more quickly? But my understanding is that that unit is not up and running and that it doesn't have a full organogram and a full staffing component, but perhaps the minister can give us some guidance on what's happening with that unit at a time that we need it more than ever. Um, then uh, on the anti-corruption hotline, my final question, Chair, um, <clears throat> I mean, it's just ironic to me given, you know, the slide talking about the the crucial role that was played by the anti-corruption hotline during this COVID looting spree that we've been seeing, uh, that initially the anti-corruption hotline was not declared as an essential service. And I think, thank goodness that that oversight was rectified because that could have been a very costly mistake. Um, but on the cases, there's a reference to about 70,000 calls, uh, of which 1,591 resulted in cases in the previous financial year. So, Chair, my question there would just be, you know, if you have 1,591 cases that were opened or that were generated, how many officials in total were then actually subject to disciplinary action based on that 1,591 cases. So that ratio is very important because you start with 70,000 calls and then a relatively small number of cases that get generated and then presumably an even smaller number of, of officials who are actually held to account and, and subject to disciplinary steps. I'm hoping that Commissioner Seloani can give us an indication of how many people exactly were actually held to account out of that 1,591. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Honorable Clark, uh, Honorable Schreiber, my apology. Um, Honorable CBC, are you on online? Uh, Masi, can you assist me if I omitted one of the Honorable Members before I take Honorable Tuli? Just text me. Honorable Tuli, over to you, ma'am. No, Chair, Honorable Chair. Um, thank you. Thank you, Chairperson. Um, my, my sincere apology, I was blocked by the fourth IR uh, and I, I couldn't get the presentation from the start, but safe to say I, I had perused the documents um, uh, sent by the uh, secretary. Now, safe to say, Magibi covered me to some of the things that I picked up uh, from those documents, because uh, in terms of the terms of the presentation, I I just came to the tail end 
but I wanted, Chair, to emphasize the point that uh, was wor very worrisome of prolonging of the investigations with the understanding that some of the things are beyond anyone's will because even if someone is suspended, he or she has still got a, a right, a, a human right. For instance, if that person is suspended, but unfortunately now he or she is sick, she has got a, a doctor's a, a notes to say, he is not fit to do one, two, three. Indeed, that person can be fit for uh, investigation as well. But that is very disturbing. Uh, the way the cases were taking, uh, 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 the, the way cases were, the time that cases were taking. But uh, one picked up that uh, there is a turnaround strategy of dealing with these cases. I think we can applaud the department for that turnaround strategy, hoping that this turnaround strategy will uh, really um, reduce the number of cases and uh, even not reduction to, 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 to do away with all these investigations. Now we'll take a case by case as the case is, has um, happened. Um, that, that, that was my emphasis, Chair, but otherwise uh, I was covered because uh, Honorable Gibi asked a lot of questions that also uh, one, one should have asked. But two, I wanted to check something, Chairperson, uh, sorry to take your time. In terms of the latest um, uh, reports over PPEs, I wanted to check whether the department is going to, to deal with such cases on its own or such cases will fall under, <coughs> under the committee which the president announced to uh, specifically deal with uh, the, 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 all the negativity that happened uh, during COVID-19 pandemic uh, relating on PPEs. Um, thank you, Chair. So, Honorable Tuli, uh, 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 Mascola, do you have any other member except myself that you have picked up on the list of uh, honorable members have joined the meeting? That no, honorable. And no honorable chair, uh, honorable Chalekulu has um, network network challenges, and I, he doesn't reflect on the list. But he was in earlier on, so we can okay. proceed. You must tell him that he missed the show because the, the declaration would have been better yesterday if he's part of this meeting. Uh, on a lighter yes. note, on a lighter note. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, from my side, uh, uh, honorable minister, and also. Commissioner Sloane, you, you will choose which one you are going to take, but I just want to say, um, uh, Commissioner Sloane, from what you have presented, that's my observation that probably if you may just convince me, if somebody asks me, why do you exist? Because in terms of your presentation, some of the cases, they take long, and what could be the cause? Uh, for an example, if a case that you investigate can take more than two years, for I can say that is too long. 
to also in terms of the amount that you have spoken to, if I heard you correctly, you said uh, uh, 106,000 or million. I don't know if you will call, correct me. Uh, with all the other allegations and issues that have been financial misconduct, really? Or probably the different entities or provincial government or uh, yeah, provincial government and other departments have taken those cases to uh, law enforcement agencies. But also probably it could be very useful to tell us what is your relationship with the, the other departments, hotline, uh, anti-corruption hotlines that they have in terms of their consultation, because you might also be narrowly reporting on only those ones pertaining uh, the hotline of the Public Service Commission, as it were. But also in a broader picture, would have given us a better space to give, it, give us a sense of comfort that at least we are we making a dent. The other one that uh, I thought we were going to talk to is 2018 anti-corruption hotline uh, program or, or, or study that you, you commissioned as a commission that uh, did it talk to how do you improve your turnaround uh, capacity and also your uh, partnership with other stakeholders and other chapter nine institutions as it were, because they also deal with some other of the elements that you, they would have ordinarily been reported to your to your hotline as it were. The, the other one that I would like probably also, also the minister, I'm not too sure whether it will be correct, but also I think with a, a, a very depleted fiscal and strengthened tax revenue that we have as the country, do you think it's, it, 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 it advisable or it's the right thing to do uh, to have uh, a multi anti corruption hotlines as, uh, currently because each and every department does have that and I, 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 and I, I think there's something that we need to talk to and also to ensure that we streamline or also there is different ads talk to each other as it were from where I'm seated uh, a minister on this one I might be wrong but also for me financially and also making a difference because I, I don't think the department is correctly to investigate themselves. Uh, that, that's my belief. Uh, the very last one, uh, I, I think honorable uh, uh, other provinces, but also uh, Commissioner Sloane, if you may assist us, where provinces that don't give you, they don't rise to the occasion in terms of giving you the necessary information so that also you can continue with your work in terms of investigation and, and so forth. What are other mechanisms or should you expect us as a committee to assist you on? Because I must say, Honorable Minister and also Commissioner Sluane, that we have committed ourselves in this administration as this committee that will ensure we do our level best at least not all the departments, but at least five departments would not appear before SCOPA moving forward. Because if we, we are doing what we're supposed to do, public service and ourselves with this committee, lesser departments should start not appearing before SCOPA. With that, let me appreciate the presentation. Uh, and uh, over to you, Minister, and also uh, Commissioner Sloane, but also the other one, a uh, uh, minister, which I know that uh, uh, Commissioner Sloane would not have talked to, is the issue of uh, taking us to confidence that do we have any acting DG in the Public Service Commission now? Uh, in the, and I'm sure moving forward without also uh, interfering with the legal processes in terms of disciplinary processes, when the time is right, also you take this committee in confidence in terms of what you would have presented to the president moving forward. Thank you very much. Over to you, Minister, Honorable Minister, and your team. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Chair. Maybe for um, some systematic uh, response, there may be one or two things that uh, officials may want to pick up. 
and then immediately thereafter we can then come in uh, with a comprehensive response from our side. Uh, I wouldn't say which ones uh, they would want to uh, pick up, but there are quite a number, a, a few technical questions that they may assist better on. With your permission, Chair. Permission granted, my Honourable Minister. Uh, uh, Ms. Yoli, DG, over to you, ma'am, and also other presenters. But uh, let's start with the first presentation so, so that we become a little bit clean in terms of approach. Thank you. Thank you, Chairperson. Um, let me check DG Mantla on the first presentation uh, if you have any issues you want to raise. Uh, uh, response, I mean, the, the questions. Yes, 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 DG, I do. Uh, thanks, thanks, uh, Honorable Chairperson, DG and the Minister. I think there's a question of the existence of the MOU on ICT between departments, whether it does it exist or not. Um, there, is, there, there, there is no MOU or MOUs in between departments uh, per se. Uh, however, what was created, uh, 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 DG and other members, uh, was, for instance, a, 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 a secretariat in our environment, um, which consists of heads of IT for various government departments. Uh, and, and this take me to the next question, why is IT rising to improve coordination? So, so those uh, heads of IT referred to as GTOC, uh, as, uh, together we developed two plans. Number one, it was a digital transmission strategy that was taken to a cabinet and we are requested to wait until the commission is appointed and finalize its work, but also the draft e-government program that I was presenting here. So, so with the support of the, of, of, of the community and obviously continuous engagement, I mean, the DG has said is going to be engaged in, for instance, DCDT, given the changes that have just taken place there. Once we've got that as a firm and acceptable program, it then gets communicated across government, and then we want to monitor implementation thereof. And maybe the last question, which is relevant for me, DG, spoke to who are the main role players uh, in the ICT space in the public service? I think uh, DPSA, uh, 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 Honorable Chair and members, is one of the main uh, players. What, become, what makes the main player? In, when you want to bring about efficiencies, you always ensure that issues of technology, process, and people are always handled and dealt with together. Now, if you are going to look at the public service sector, the general role of DPSA, it plays in that space. They then Department of Home Affairs, as indicated, they are responsible for identity management in the country. And that becomes very important when you go to an online space. And then you've got DCDT, um, um, or maybe let me let me dip this till uh, last. We've got national treasure that deals with the funding of, of all government initiatives. And it becomes important that they are there, they understand the need, and, and SSA from security point of view. But the reason why I'm dealing with DCDT last is because they are responsible, or they are charged with responsible of ensuring that there is um, you, uh, let me call it ubiquitous access to ICT network coverage and services, which talks to the last point of, of the concerns around lack of coverage in rural areas. Indeed, it is true, and the, and, and the current era that we are in of COVID has kind of shown us how unequal we are, even from an IC point of view. The CDT has got a structure called universal service and access obligations, where the industry contributes um, the last time it was between 0.2 to 0.5% of their turnover to ensure that there is universal access to ICT. So, 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 so I think I want to end. I want. I want to end it there, DJ, and, and one of the chain members. Thank you, thank you, Mantla. Uh, Solomon, do you want to take a bite on some of the questions? Yes, thank you, Solomon. Oh, yes. Okay. I think I'm more audible now. Um, thank you, DG. Uh, my response would be to, to the first, um, uh, Honorable Kibi, the question around the strategy that we implement in terms to um, um, make sure that people adhere to the practice of um, submitting questions or submitting their answers to the DPSA. We write numerous letters, and we wrote numerous letters over time to departments to um, create awareness around the issue, but also to request them to um, provide us with the information and provide them with background. Why do we need that? There was also a lot of follow-up being done by the D DG's office um, self 
in terms of getting um, the answers, where we now at a situation where the minister actually intervened with um, the other ministers and letters are going out to the um, departments where there will be one-on-one -on -one discussions with the HODs to assess what is it that is um, uh, the, the issue for um, suspensions, but also to identify strategies that the DPSA can assist these departments with so that we can address the backlogs and also the issue of discipline management. So in terms of the, um, the backlog and people not submitting in the third quarter, the fourth quarter, it is due to the lockdown. It really um, upset a lot of um, the work that we were doing, but will not really um, impact on the work because the work still continued. It's just that people did not respond to the DPSA to say what did they do. And um, if I can then address the issue of Honorable Malazzi that said that um, Mr. if there Solman, is... Mr. Solman, one second, I'm sorry. It mm. can't be because of the COVID-19. You know why? Because they have to submit electronically, unless you're saying that they're posting papers in terms of reporting. I'm just saying that you must be very careful that that one doesn't hold the water from where I'm seated. Thank you. You may proceed. Yes, Honorable, you, you're quite right. That's why we um, are following up with the different departments so that we still do get that information. Now, um, in terms of what uh, Honorable Malazzi indicated, um, if there is any statistics on the information that resulted in criminal charges, that we do not have. And that is one of the issues that we're trying to address now with this um, uh, um, project that we have with the Canadian government, where we will have a streamline of information and actually a system where we can track and see which of these disciplinary um, cases um, resulted in criminal charges so that we can also see the value chain of this. Um, then, uh, Honorable Motsepe indicated the role of the DPSA to facilitate um, and train of uh, uh, the chairpersons and the um, discipline persons. Now, um, the DPSA has that role now for quite some time. And um, currently, this year, we are at set ourselves the target to train 200 more um, discipline management um, chairpersons and in, uh, um, initiators. But one of the issues that we found now is also that some people, although they're on the list, they feel that they may be a threat to them or they're not um, willing to assist with some of the cases and that we find more and more. And that is one of the issues that we will address soon so that we can um, also see how to protect people when they want to be um, uh, chairpersons. The two provinces that um, did not uh, provide us with information is Gauteng and Pumalanga, as was said. So if I can then address the, um, some of the issues raised by um, Honorable Schreiber. Um, the question was, what was the reason for them not submitting? I don't know. They did not indicate to us. Um, the recourse that we have is, um, again, to write them letters and to have direct engagements, DG to DG. I know that the Office of the DG was also in um, contact with them to try the, to um, get the information. Then you're quite right that it was 84 million that um, resulted in misconduct um, for the previous year. And that 84 million is salaries. It's not the um, uh, cost of disciplinary proceedings. So it's the cost of the salaries that's paid to um, the people that suspended. And um, yeah, I think that is so far as my responses are, DG. Thank you. Thank you, Solomon. I think that the question, just as a, as a wrap up, Chaperson, the, there was the question around backlog in provinces. I think the real backlog in terms of the real impact of COVID in terms of the backlog in cases, we're going to experience it with quarter one, 2020, 20, 21 cases, because um, um, uh, this report that we're presenting now, quarter four covers January to March. 
So in March, the, the, the COVID was just starting. So this is from a substantive point of view of the cases that needed to be given attention that may not have been given attention because of the issues around uh, COVID. In terms of the um, um, uh, reasons why um, the, they have a backlog as departments now in terms of resolving the cases, why is it taking longer? Departments give a number of reasons. I've given, uh, we've highlighted some of the reasons uh, in the in the response that we have given. Uh, some of them correlate to complexity of cases, unavailability of investigators and chairperson. Um, um, uh, management uh, engaging with unions, uh, interference by outside stakeholders. There's also an issue around discipline management being delegated to labor relations practitioners that has, has come up as an issue. And the structures of labor relations apparently not having the sufficient capacity to be able to do this work. Those are some of the issues that have come up from some of the provinces as reasons for their backlogs. In terms of uh, the other question I wanted to pick up, I think from Honorable Malazi, I just wanted to say that on the question around the statistical info regarding those that have resulted in criminal processes, the, we, um, the, the conversations or engagements we're having with the criminal justice system, in particular the South African police services, is exactly around this creating a mechanism where um, the reporting and the investigation and the processing of these cases at SAPS is tracked. Um, there, there, there is capability built in SAPS to track them so that we we can interface with SAPS at the level of getting reports because it is SAPS that does investigations on criminal cases, working with the other criminal, I mean, with the other criminal justice system players. It is not the department, uh, but we can we interface at the level of sharing information and making follow-ups and etc. So we have made a proposal. The minister met actually with the minister for SAPS, the minister for police, and the minister for justice. And we presented a number of proposals to them in relation to how we coordinate and strengthen our efforts in relation uh, to this work around tracking some of the criminal cases in the system involving public servants. Um, the other question in terms of blacklisting of public servants found guilty, it's unfortunate that currently we don't have a system that interfaces with municipalities. Uh, municipalities have their own systems. We have our own system as the public service, which means the national and provincial departments. With national and provincial departments, uh, if you you are disciplined and you go through a process, you are fired. Uh, they they are um, in terms of our regulations and 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 and, and the laws. They are um, uh, if you, for instance, you have committed financial misconduct and you get fired from the public service, you will not be allowed to rejoin the public service. I think there's a five-year period that you are not allowed to join the public service. And we can easily monitor that in the public service because the report is put on PESAL. So PESAL will do a block on that particular person once the disciplinary process has been completed and the person has been fired. I so saw that block will ensure that the person does not get appointed again in the personal system until the period of the misconduct um, in terms of the law. And there's, a, there's different categories for different numbers of, number of years that the person can be um, uh, allowed not to come back to the public service for a certain period of time. However, with the municipalities, there is no interface at this stage with that particular system. And I can't really speak about what systems the municipalities have at a, at a, at a local level. And I, I suppose they have different systems themselves. I don't get a sense that there's one system coordinating. Um, Honorable Motsepe, I think the issue of unavailability of investigators and chairpersons it's uh, it's also really we we rely on people who, who already have their responsibilities so they are not employed to be investigators and chairpersons but they have other responsibilities in the departments that they do but there is an agreement with our departments that these people will be availed as and when there's cases that they need to uh, to attend to um, um, uh, however i think the system is really not perfect um, uh, because they have other responsibilities so if a person says 
I have these deliverables to deliver in the department and I'm unable to take additional work, which is the case is a particular case, then we would not be in a position to face those people to force. That's why we need a pool to be bigger and bigger. And um, there was, uh, the, okay, the two provinces, Gauteng and Pumalanga. So what happens typically is I get reports from the team and immediately I communicate with the DGs. The system we communicate with the DGs is our own WhatsApp system, which, so when I get the report from the team, the presentation from the team, even with this one, then I wrote to the DGs to say, uh, these are the provinces that are still having outstanding information. These are the departments that are having outstanding information. I, I have asked my team to give you one more day so that you can submit the information and we integrate it in the report. Please do the submissions. Gauteng specifically insisted that they have submitted to us. They said they submitted the report on our COVID reporting email. <clears throat> and we checked that we, 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 we have no report from Gauteng on, on the quarterly labor relations report submitted on the COVID email. And I did feedback to the to the director general of the province in relation to that matter and uh, we have not received a report from them pumalanga has not made any contact after i had indicated i had shown the information of the teachers uh, departments that are outstanding so we 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 have prepared letters for minister because now these are matters that we want to escalate and we believe that maybe by escalating the matters to the executive authorities, at least uh, the executive authorities will assist to get their DGs to move and to get the people who are supposed to deliver on these deliver deliverables uh, to do so um, uh, on time. I think the question around the technical advisory unit, unit uh, the, the, the politics of it or the content of it, the minister will, will, will attend to it. But from our side really is to say that the unit is in the structure, the unit is operational, and there's a recruitment process to ensure that all positions in the unit are, are filled. However, we are faced with the reality as the department of not having sufficient funds to respond to the type of the work that is required for this unit to do. So we don't have sufficient resources because there is no additional resources that have been given to the department for this unit. We've had to reprioritize internally from our resources. And on top of that, you would recall that for COVID um, relief funds, the National Treasury has come to the departments and took some money. So from our baseline, about 80 million has been taken as the department, and it has affected some of the deliverables that uh, relate to how we strengthen our capability as, 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 as the department. So, But we are prioritizing and reprioritizing internally with the limited resources that we have. Um, the unit is quite active with all the challenges around the resources that I've mentioned, and there's lots of thought and thinking and work that is happening and partnerships that are being entered into with the uh, criminal justice system or with law enforcement agencies. Thank you. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you, DG. Honorable Sloan, Honorable Minister, I suggest that you, you are the last so that you'll cover other things that are also public service commission, as it were. Uh, Thank you very uh, much. Oh, oh, you want? No, 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 I'm yeah. suggesting that we, you be the last. Okay. 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 Uh, Thank you very much. Over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Chairperson. I think there, there are about two or three th uh, uh, issues that uh, I would have to explain. Uh, one is about the establishment of national anti-corruption hotline. Uh, before 2004 there were a number of hotlines from different departments uh, soliciting uh, uh, whistleblowers to, uh, to blow the whistle on uh, maladministration and corruption. And because of uh, 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 proliferation of these hotlines, cabinet took a decision that they must all be meshed into one national anti-corruption hotline. And then uh, uh, that it must be managed by the PSC. And then the purpose of the hotline is to receive complaints and then refer them to various departments. So that departments must investigate those complaints and then uh, 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 finalize the reports and then institute disciplinary action in that regard. So that's how it works. So uh, in answering the question of uh, Honorable Member Sh uh, uh, Shriver. 
There is, in 2019-20, 70,500 complaints that came in. But most of those complaints is that a person is asking, where is the Department of Health? Then you give that person information, and then it's done. Some of the uh, uh, question may be uh, something which is being investigated by law enforcement agents. So those hu that huge number are not cases that we investigate. So they are closed there and there. But out of those cases, 1,591 were generated as cases, of which majority of them, about 63%, were uh, referred to SASA. But SASA is a public entity established through the Public Finance Management Act and is accountable to the Minister of Social Development and not necessarily to the Department of Social Development. So majority of those cases go to SASA and then we close them as the commission. So it doesn't come back. So uh, uh, the amount of money is what SASA told us, that uh, they involved 217,000 and then they recovered 106. It's only with respect to SASA. It's not about all financial misconduct, uh, so that I link this to. PSC continues to do a, a, a monitoring report on financial misconduct, where after every case has been finalized, it's reported to the PSC and to the DPSA and to National Treasury. So we consolidate those reports to check how much they are involved, how much has been recovered uh, 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 in that regard. And then also, uh, uh, currently, we are looking at unauthorized expenditure, irregular expenditure, fruitless and wasteful expenditure of the previous year in order to check how, 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 how much of that money uh, uh, is being recovered and how many officials are being charged of that uh, financial misconduct. So that's how the linkage is. So the National Anti-Corruption Hotline majority, those cases as we uh, receive them, we refer them to various departments according to the cabinet resolution. And then as we are operating this hotline, we realize that some departments are establishing hotlines which are competing with the hotline that is established by uh, uh, cabinet. So we made uh, 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 a report to indicate that uh, 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 there are this number of departments which are uh, 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 establishing hotlines. Uh, the minister, I think, will uh, uh, finalize, uh, will, uh, will answer on this one because uh, it is the DPSA that uh, uh, coordinates uh, this function. And then uh, the issue of relationship with, oh, no, no, I've dealt with that. How do we improve? I've indicated in the, in the report that uh, uh, we have observed that operating nine to five and five, nine to five a day and five days a week is uh, uh, not efficient, that we need to improve, uh, uh, operate 24 hours, and seven days a week. But to do that, we would need some additional funding because the commission also, like other uh, uh, departments, uh, uh, money was taken away towards COVID. So it will not be able to do that. But there is money which is, in, uh, 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 is earmarked for anti-corruption activities uh, uh, managed by the Department of Justice. So we are going to, uh, uh, we're asking for five million from that uh, funding is called CARA funding uh, to be able to improve uh, uh, in that regard. And then we welcome uh, uh, the issue of the portfolio committee to assist that all the departments do not appear in scope because they appear mainly because of unauthorized expenditure, irregular expenditure, fruitless and wasteful expenditure. If uh, uh, our report on financial misconduct can capture uh, some of those issues. We can then uh, uh, intervene with various departments to make sure that they address uh, uh, those uh, uh, misconduct even before the annual uh, uh, report is, uh, is done. So there is a relationship. Now that we have, uh, uh, out of the report, we have indicated 508 were referred to departments. 
there will be a relationship between the national anti-corruption hotline and the, the report which has been presented by DPSA on misconduct, because some of the cases that have been reported on which are misconduct, some of them come from the national anti-corruption anti -corruption hotline, but others uh, uh, come to the department directly. In the similar way, we don't only deal with national anti-corruption hotline investigations as the PSC. Uh, 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 whistleblowers can come to the uh, PSC directly or send a, a letter or send uh, put on the website their complaint. And then we have a unit called Public Administration Investigations, which will then investigate these cases and then uh, uh, recommend sanctions uh, uh, when necessary to different departments. And sometimes even issue direct directions to make sure that uh, if there were irregular appointments, that uh, the department should approach the court to set those appointments uh, aside. I think that's uh, uh, yeah. the questions that came to our, uh, our attention. Oh, maybe the one on PPEs. Uh, with PPEs, the president issued a proclamation that all complaints regarding uh, PPEs must be uh, sent to uh, uh, SIU. So we received some of the complaints about PPEs, and I, I, I would give uh, uh, this example that in Haute, we then say, in order to avoid duplication of resources in terms of investigation, we'd rather refer those cases to the SIU. And when the SIU has finished, uh, uh, we'll then get a report which will then uh, assess whether it addressed uh, those problems. So I would end up here. Thank uh, you. If I've missed anything, probably uh, the minister may uh, deal with those, especially about the reputation of the PSC. No, thank you very much, Commissioner. Honorable Minister, over to you. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Just want to start with uh, what I think we need to share with you as a kind of a baseline in terms of dealing with issues of discipline, um, uh, uh, suspensions and all those uh, uh, processes so that we are together in terms of knowing where we are and where we are trying to go, but without any detail. The, uh, the first thing is that um, when we reconfigured the um, organogram of the department, which comes into um, official, uh, officially comes into effect on the 1st of April next year, we um, uh, removed the um, branch called the uh, policy analysis. And we did that so that we could, it could give way to another branch called um, um, labor relations. Uh, I, 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 I don't know specifically what they call it, but it's a branch that deals with labor relations. There is all disciplinary cases, all labor-related uh, matters, because we knew that um, we are uh, being confronted by uh, quite a plethora of issues, and we, did, we needed a dedicated branch just to deal with these matters. So our capacity has increased uh, as we talk, and this is the uh, status quo. We should uh, be having the head of the branch Starting, um, if I uh, because interviews have been conducted and finalized, I think they are doing administrative things. Uh, if all goes well, we should uh, that fellow should start in a month or two. That's a warm body that is getting into that uh, uh, branch. Uh, secondly, uh, DG has covered us on uh, the unit. Just to say to the honorable members, um, as far as the organogram is concerned, what done with DAO, that is uh, the uh, discipline and eth eth ethics uh, uh, advisory uh, committee or a team or unit as we call it. It's a technical team that assists us on that. It locates uh, um, the unit in the office of the DG and that is done Two its own organogram, that is its own structure, was done, completed. 
The only thing is to put warm bodies there. There are warm bodies there, but um, uh, they are uh, on an acting basis. But we know that uh, there, were, there were interviews last week for the head of that uh, uh, unit. And um, I'm expecting that uh, uh, the person should start uh, very soon uh, because uh, that was that has been done. And then that will be followed by filling up all other uh, positions below that chief director. So the, and, and that will add capacity in terms of dealing with, with these cases. In terms of thinking, in terms of developing policy, in terms of liaising with uh, other um, uh, uh, departments, especially law enforcement uh, agencies, and that will facilitate, instead of facilitate um, a better functionality, you know, better processing of these cases, add new thinking in terms of how we should uh, um, resolve the teething problems that we are talking about at the moment. Before we had this unit dedicated, you would have a problem because there wouldn't be anybody dedicated on a daily basis uh, to deal with this. It would be a touch and go, and we can't work like that. And that and and and, and that is going to add capacity. In terms of uh, the strategy, we have been using circulars, and we're going to continue using circulars, giving departments at different levels of government. Uh, where we are in terms of uh, their own cases per department. But we've realized that there's a slow turnaround. And we now have compiled information per, per department, per sphere, to say to the EA, uh, relevant EA, here are your disciplinary cases. Uh, whether they are five years, some that are five years, four years, two years, whatever, um, here is the amount, something similar to what we are presenting here. And then this would be followed by um, a one on one engagement, that is, our department and, and their department to say, We have given you this information. If you uh, can, you confirm it or you, or, you, or you contest it. And once we agree, how are you dealing with this? And then um, we make each other account so that we are not the only ones who, who account to you um, because it seems like we are not doing our job and that's not us, it's uh, departments. But um, we now are taking it upon ourselves to supervise, uh, which is not strictly our job uh, to, uh, you know, be operational in the affairs of each department. But because there is a slow pace, uh, we are using um, whatever uh, legislation and whatever uh, role we have as public service to uh, to deal with uh, uh, this matter uh, uh, so that there is improvement. Now, this is going to be, what is going to assist us in the near future is the implementation of the single public service, which we are pursuing with Minister of uh, Local Government, uh, that is COPTA. Um, it will be it will be able to facilitate all these things that DG is uh, talking about. That we, we only operate national and provincial, but we now will go down to the uh, to the uh, province, to the uh, to local government. The next thing that I want to talk to about uh, this as a final thing is on the issues of chairs and 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 the initiators. We we have decided on a pool system. Uh, both uh, a pool system of initiators uh, per province, um, and and uh, uh, per per province and up to up to national. We want to continue with that project so that at any given time, if a department or, uh, uh, indicates or we realize that there's a problem, and we are approaching um, uh, uh, 40, 50 days, uh, going to 90 days, we we'll start intervening. This will be the work that DAO will have to do, monitoring and uh, in, and telling us timely when to intervene, in which case, in, in order to supervise timelessly on those matters. Mm -hmm. We have, as a matter of fact, at the highest level, um, written to 18 judges, uh, retired judges in the Republic, 
and uh, we have uh, an increasing number of, of those who are responding positively. The last time I checked, we had two, that is last week, who had said uh, we are available all the time without uh, any fee. Um, and, and, and we're hoping to move it with, with that direction. If we can get between 10 and 12 retired judges for serious cases, because we want also to use the profile and, of, of, and, and knowledge in these cases and not be wishy-washy in terms of dealing with them. That is, that is going to come. I, I just want to say to uh, members, um, I'm happy that uh, um, um, uh, Solomon did indicate that the amounts indicated there are not necessarily money that is gone. It's in the form of salaries um, that a suspended person or suspended persons continue to draw. Uh, and, and there isn't anything that we can do with it with, without, without about it. Uh, but just to assure members that when cases of fraud uh, that are criminal, uh, it doesn't matter whether you resign, whether you are suspended, whether you run away, it does not matter when what the wrong that you did in public service is criminal, not like uh, insulting another person in the department and all those matters. But if it's criminal, it follows you to death, those those cases, and we have them. So it, it, it's not like uh, you will just uh, do something wrong in the department, in the public service, and then you escape uh, uh, just like that. And by the way, I must indicate that uh, uh, in, in due course, pub, uh, um, uh, uh, the pursuit of uh, a single public administration uh, will involve uh, all public servants uh, as we move on. Yeah, but we want to start with a single public service and then go single public administration, if not simultaneously. Well, it will help to go to SOEs, judges, and uh, I mean, a judiciary and all of that, so that we have a, a kind of a uniform approach. Now, having said all these things that I've said uh, about um, Yes, uh, we're worried as well about length of time in some cases. That's why we're taking a, a, this uh, a particular initiative. Let me just end up on this issue that, but we, 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 we are noticing overall decline um, in, in, in uh, 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 things like length of time, uh, things like suspensions and so on. But let me indicate one thing that sometimes happens. You know, I know of one province that has suspended a number of officials. Now, this is week three since that happened. Now, in week three, uh, there hasn't been any hearing. Um, uh, I'm just putting an ear on it uh, so that I take notes of how these things sometimes develop. The issue is um, those who are suspended are contesting the suspension. Um, and, and, and we haven't gotten to a level where you start appointing, you start charging. There are no charges. Uh, there's no presiding officer. There's no initiate, initiator. The only thing that is there is a contest, and this is week three. So this is, this is what we need to take uh, to our stride to say to, to, to say to provinces and departments in our engagement, we will say, when is it advisable to suspend a person? You don't suspend a person just because you you don't like them or you have picked up something annoying and so on. You must at the same time um, uh, really um, take steps, uh, uh, be decisive in terms of what's going to follow. That's why, and, 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 and hope hopefully within 90 days, all of it. Let me proceed. Now I've dealt with Inter um, interviews, yes. PPE is, uh, PS is correct. Uh, now, as far as the corruption of PPE is, is concerned, one, it is that uh, all departments in the Republic, provincially or nationally, they have been instructed to um, uh, collect all their information on PPEs, and that includes public service and then send the, all that information uh, to SIU uh, and Treasury. Uh, and so that from there, 
this, what will happen after that, it will be analyzed. And additional information will be sought. And this will include who um, has got a tender, when were they established, who are the directors, how much, how did they get the tender over and above others. Um, and this will start, will culminate uh, in the committee uh, of six ministers publicizing that information from local government up to national, just publicizing it so that in your area, in your municipality, in your province, and in a relevant department, you see the lists and you see amounts, you see the people who got the tender when they were established and all of that. That is what uh, will happen. But after that, it will be followed by treasury analysis to say were all procedures followed uh, properly without uh, failure? If not, uh, and then there would be their recommendation. Where there's criminality or wrongdoing, it will go to relevant uh, law enforcement agencies. That is how things are lined up uh, at the moment in, in, in relation to um, COVID-related uh, corruption. And, and it's going to get them. And let me pass this. Go to anti-corruption hotline. Uh, this is the, uh, my last but one question. Anti-corruption uh, hotline, it is desirable that we have one at national level, that we have one at a provincial level. Uh, but what we may need to look at is that we remove it from the office of the premier um, or anywhere else because commissioners uh, also come from provinces, may be relocated to, uh, to the, uh, to the uh, PSC, but at provincial level. And then at national level, uh, it, it must continue reciting with, uh, with the PSC for independence and for, you know, um, cross-checking uh, and, 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 and for dedication instead of uh, just with uh, EAs and so on. That is that is what we are going to uh, push. Let me just uh, ask uh, um, uh, the representative of the PSC who are here uh, to tomorrow engage the chair and the commission as a whole to initiate uh, initiate a submission so that we don't talk and talk and not act. Let them initiate a, a submission. Uh, uh, to review with a view to improving rather than uh, talking about uh, site issues of where it must be located and so on. It's located correctly there, but we need to close whatever gap and, and then submit and then close all other hotlines, uh, which uh, may become cold lines in terms of uh, uh, their work, uh, their output. Uh, so the the we can we can we can work with the PSC from ministry uh, while they develop uh, uh, the, this approach that we are talking about. So tomorrow, start uh, discussing this at the PSC. We will follow and then we initiate the submission and then we we'll push it that way. My last one is uh, um, a briefing on the PSC. Yes, uh, Chair. Uh, there is a, an acting person in the acting DG in the PSC who has been appointed and is in office now uh, after the suspension of uh, the uh, director general there. And uh, the uh, disciplinary hearing is, is scheduled for 9 and 10 September. Um, and all parties have agreed to 9 and 10 September 2020 for the teaching in, in, in the PSC. That's how things are proceeding at the moment. For, your, for, for, for all your information. Thank you, uh, Chair. If I've left anything else, uh, maybe uh, Chair could consider uh, giving Deputy Minister uh, if she has uh, things to fill up. Thank you. I'm covered, Chair. Chair. Uh, chair. Uh, Honourable Minister, are you done? Yes, very yes. much. Done. Okay, very my apologies. I, I lost the network. 
safe to Ooh. say to honor, uh, uh, thank you. Probably honorable members, let's thank the presentation and the responses and say that mm -hmm. still a work on progress, which seems like slightly encouraging, but we still have to put more weight, honorable minister and public service commission. And of course, probably honorable members moving forward, when we meet with the department, we must get a, 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 a feedback in terms of Gauteng and Bumalanga in terms of submitting uh, their reports as well, so that the uh, commission can have a, a complete uh, report of all provinces. The other one, uh, Honourable Minister, that we would like to raise, which is outside the presentations that have been presented today, is the I did have a chat with the princip uh, NSG principal to say if he, he can try and assist us to tailor made a dedicated training for the portfolio committee to be assisted or capacitated on doing our robust, uh, active uh, uh, financial oversight and also oversight in this way. Because there are new laws and, and, and regulations that are in place that might come handy if we are workshopped or on a three months or whatever, that a, a, a training module that can talk to that specifically for the committee or suggest something along those lines. But also, honorable members and the minister, I would like just to, to, to remind the Public Service Commission that in terms of the act, it also suggests that if there are any other issues that you feel that the EAs are not listening to you, no, notwithstanding the current uh, the relationship that you enjoy with the, with the minister of DPSA, but also you can escalate to him. Uh, since I joined Parliament, I've never had that the Public Service Commission have taken the president in confidence on, on some of the matters that they've got challenges in terms of unblocking them or getting a, a positive feedback after they've done their investigation. The other one, Honourable Minister, I think we agree on is the issue of making sure that we popularise the Public, uh, the public uh, uh, Service Commission and, the, and their work in the rural areas, which means we are asked here to think outside the box so that they are able also not only to apply, but they are also up, able to complain if they're not happy with some or getting or reporting the departments that are not doing their work in a, in a proper way. Uh, other than that, honorable members, let me take this opportunity. Uh, uh, Chair, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, honorable Malazi. Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Oh, you want just to chip in before I close, okay? Yeah, yes, I wanted to do a follow-up, and I waited for you to finish your summary um, before I before oh. I do the follow-up, um, because there, there was an unanswered question there. So okay, I just okay. Hey, uh, Honourable Malati, probably let's do this. I will allow you, but probably I'll urge other co uh, honourable members if they do also have follow-ups whom they think that they are not responded to adequately, to do it in writing and then we can receive it through Maskole in terms of the responses. But you may because you are already on the floor. Okay. No, I, I appreciate that. I asked a, question, a specific question about um, the, the, the leadership's appetite for blacklisting of public um, servants who have been found guilty um, through various disciplinary processes in, in, in the public service um, so that we can prevent this um, repetition of resurgence of people who have been found um, to have acted improperly in, in previous positions that they held in the public service, having them reappear elsewhere in the public service um, without having been rehabilitated. Um, so that, you know, these disciplinary processes are just not punitive in terms of addressing the indiscretion that happened when one occupied a specific position, but can also serve as a deterrent for future um, behavior, knowing very well that serving in the public service is the greatest honor that one can have um, towards their country. And, and that question wasn't answered, Chair, so I'd, I'd like to have a response to that. The teacher answered it. Uh, okay, no, no, one second, Honorable Minister. Honorable Malazi, probably you might have the same similar problem with the connectivity. It has been answered in this form. 
to say that those ones which have got criminal uh, uh, court judgments, so they are supposed not to be employed within the public service, not less than five years, depending on the case and the magnitude of the case. But also in terms of uh, other 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 uh, 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 other cases of maladministration or misconduct, as it were, there are other processes that moving forward. Also, what we need to uh, to, to ask from the departments to do the so-called name and shame so that we blacklist them. And I think that's the suggestion that you are saying. But in a way, it was indirectly uh, responded to. But I would suggest that the minister also categorize. Um, if he can be possible to do that, on which cases where you can just get, uh, it depends on what penalty you have received during the, the disciplinary cases or, or, or a process that you are given a written warning depending on the case and also you have been uh, fired. That's another case that then you get blacklisted if you are fired. But also if the court of law also have found you guilty, also your imprisonment or through the bail also, that one has got its own implications in terms of not to be recycled. I totally agree with you that the recycling must stop. But I'm sure, Minister, just a quick one on that. Take if you want to. It, 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 it merely would be to say uh, the appetite is there. Uh, if, I, if, I, if we could have our way, uh, you, you do um, all these cases that are considered serious, like fraud and so on, you never come back to public service. Now, maybe to show appetite, we, we, we will need to go to the Constitution once more, go to the, the legislative framework uh, to scrap at the ceiling, to see, to maximize um, uh, um, on the side of the state and the people of South Africa against the uh, somebody who is prone to doing wrong things, even going to an extent of saying, if a person has done the same thing twice, even after coming back, what, what, what do we need to do? Including maybe initiating a, a bill or a new law along those lines. So it is open both to us as a department, but also to members uh, to uh, think outside the box on this matter. But let's, let's just look within the legislative and the constitutional framework and see what else needs to be done to tighten up over and above what the chair has said. Thank you very much. Okay, no, thanks very much. I think that's the thing that is the home take for us as, as the portfolio committee also to engage, but hopefully we'll be putting our brains together before the end of this year, which is 2020. Other than that, I trust and I hope that honorable members, all of us who are satisfied, if there are any other questions and follow-ups, I'll suggest that we do them in writing so that when they come back, they also respond to those ones and also during the, our uh, interactions with the, with the department and the Public Service Commission, they can talk to those issues. Thank you very much, honorable members and uh, minister and the commissioners, Luane and DM and the team for your patience. I know that we, we overstepped the time that we, we aim to finish at, but I think it was a useful and fruitful uh, meeting that we really want to deal with the corruption and have a, a very efficient and uh, e ethical public service as it were. Have a blessed evening. See you tomorrow. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you, Jay. Bye. Thank you very much, Bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye, Jay. Bye-bye, comrades. Bye. 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 Bye.